So, Susan, um, it was, uh, you, you were here before me, obviously, and so when you first started <laughs> these things, um, I didn't know about. So, what, how did you get to the creation of the Bus Stop Club and the CAP project, and how, how did some, how, a little plotted history of how, how we got to, to okay. here? Well, we moved from, I moved from London when I got married to Alistair, okay. um, who's now very ancient, <laughs> <laughs> but he's, he's keeping really well, actually. And uh, we were at another church, and then he wanted to go to one church, I wanted to go to one church, you know. We didn't really settle particularly well. And then we had friends who came here, and they were telling us about Turbury Church, okay. which it was then. Mm -hmm. And we came, and I've been here ever since, wow. which is a, probably about 18 years, I think. Oh, wow. So uh, three different names, maybe, then, has there been in the yeah. life of the church? Turbury, and then River of River Life. River of Life. And then, yeah. and then Hope. Wow. Uh, so, so what have been some of the highlights of, of working with the Bus Stop Club and, uh, and bringing it about? And so it's a big question. I did email you it beforehand, because I thought, I, thought I, it's a, I don't want to spring it on you, because there's probably lots, aren't there? I've been so busy. I'm yeah. Kind of, I mean, the highlight for me is the people here. Uh -huh. You know? You know who you are. Each one of you mm. that have been helped through bus stop or through CAP. Yeah. Um, it's, I'm a people person, yeah. as people know. <laughs> and um, that's been the highlight, really, oh, okay. of being able to get alongside people and help yeah. them and just support them when they've, you know, had yeah. a rough time or things yeah. have been going on in their lives. Because, you know, it's, I've, I've had that, you know, background myself. I've been yes. through tough times. So you, you, you hope that what you've been through will help other people. Yes. And that leads on nicely to the next question. How have you persevered and carried on? Because it's like, uh, <laughs> that's the hardest thing, keeping going, isn't it? How have yeah. you kept on going, trying to help people? And Yeah. Um, you know, once I know that God is in something, I don't give up very easily, okay. do I? <laughs> so, um, and I always knew that, that, you know, when I got to retirement age, then, yeah. you know, it's time to look for another avenue of ministry, yeah, yeah, yeah. really, which is what's happened. Yeah. Um, but all the way through, yeah, uh, it's the prayers of people, yeah. it's the support, like people who used to come to the cafe on a Friday, like Jennifer and Stuart, and um, all the people who've signed up to be befrienders, people here from other churches. Mm -hmm. Derek and I, from the very beginning, we had this vision to do something based mm. on, uh, you know, in this area. Yeah. We couldn't have done anything without him, so thank yeah. you, Derek, yeah. and Sue for allowing him to, <laughs> to do that. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear, don't say that. Oh dear. <laughs> All right, we don't want to get into that. Um, <laughs> the, um, but it's interesting that Susan and retirement, they don't really sit, do they? And so it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a strange thing. But I guess you, you're retiring from the bus stop club. Full time. Yeah, full time. And so, so what do you think's in place now that wasn't in place when you first came and started this? Do you feel some things have been completed or in place that weren't there? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot more available in the community. Mm. I think, especially because of COVID, a lot of churches are more aware of the needs in their own area. Yeah. You're here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, living locally. Mm. There's things like um, the community ladder in Ferndown. Mm. So there's, there's lots of kind of community support. Yeah. When we started, there was nothing up here. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. So um, I think that's what's changed. Mm. And also, yeah, with COVID, I think people have realized that we need to actually be community together wherever yeah. we live or whatever church we attend. Yes. Uh, you know, we, we need to be actually more like family. Yeah. Um, I think it's broken down that, a bit of the isolation that we that we've developed as a society. Yeah. And the CAP project's continuing on, isn't it? So Yeah, th that, that, it is. The, yeah, so the work will carry on in many ways. Yeah, yeah. so Pam, Pam's away this weekend. She's really sorry she's missing this. Mm. Tracy Ann's here, of course. <laughs> and Roy, her <laughs> lovely dad. <laughs> um, so they will carry on with a new management committee yeah. under, under the direction of yourself and the leaders here. Yeah. So. I'm really, really pleased that that's able to carry on. Yeah. And, and the store cupboards, we hope, as well. That's right, yeah. Um, what about the future? You got some hopes and aspirations for the future? Mm, yes. Just a few. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
every year I always, I always look for some training that I could do online or um, something that's going to help me to help other people better. Mm -hmm. And like for the last five years, I've been doing uh, online stuff and going to conferences on trauma. Okay. So last summer I said, Lord, I think I've had enough of trauma. <laughs> um, and so what, what do you have for me? I, I'm, mm. I, all my life I just feel like I'm open, whatever God says. Yes. It's the best thing, just say yes. Mm. Um, and and every, a lot of people know that's my bottom line really. Just mm. say yes, everything will work out. So last year I started looking at chaplaincy. I'm like, oh, it's a lot of the skills that I use already. Mm. You know, it's just the study bit yeah. that's, that's different. So I spoke to Derek, he said, yeah, go for it. So um, I was, I was, uh, I looked at all the universities and the one in Birmingham were doing what I call a generic course. So it didn't matter what background you had. I'm not, I'm not um, ordained. I'm not a nurse. I'm not a teacher, mm. you know, but I'm adult ed. Mm. So I found a course that was um, open to anyone who wanted yes. to do chaplaincy. So I've been doing that all year. I reckon I've passed. I haven't got the certificate yet, but, you <laughs> yeah. know, I'm pretty certain I've yes. passed. Then it would have something to say if I hadn't passed. <laughs> so um, do it again. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, thanks. But I've learned a lot doing that. And through that, I started to work as a volunteer at St Anne's. Okay. So I'm, quite, I'm involved there two days a week. And that's continuing. And I'm hoping they'll give me a little job yes. to, to help with people who are discharged. So, you know, you can imagine when people are discharged from St Anne's, things can unravel pretty quickly mm. and then they're back in hospital. Yeah. So I'm saving the NHS money by um, putting support in when they get discharged. So uh, that's the plan. Okay. Um, when that will happen, I don't know. But at the moment, I'm still a volunteer. Yeah. I've also got other kind of doors that I'm knocking on, mm. let's just say, and yeah. see what happens. That's right. Well, that's great to, to hear those things. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. But, um, Susan's not leaving yet, and uh, she'll be around over the summer and into the autumn. And uh, so it's not totally finished, is part -time. it? Yeah, part time. So uh, there, that's, let's pray again. Um, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for Susan. Lord, we, we do thank you for all that she shared and all the many things she has not shared, Lord Jesus. We thank you that all those unseen things, and that's not just true for Susan's life, but for all of our lives. Lord, you see all of what's going on in our lives, Lord, and there will be a day where we will give an account to you. So we, we thank you for all those little things that she's done for people that haven't been seen, but have been seen by you. Uh, and we praise you and look to you, and, and we know that you're the one who inspires us to love and to care for others. So as we are here this morning, Lord, we, we, we turn our eyes out to our world. And Lord, as we're aware, as we've gone through pandemics and there's wars and there's always rumours of wars, Lord, we are aware of such pain, such difficulty in the world, Lord, such fear in people's hearts and minds. So we ask that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, would come. Lord, it would come in our community and guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And it would come in our families, Lord Jesus, and bring reconciliation and hope and joy. We pray for the grace of God to be lavished upon your world, Lord. And we know that many are in opposition to that. Many would rebel against that. Many would not say yes to that. So we pray that you'd keep us humble, keep us serving, and keep us loving despite the opposition we might face. So bless the continued work of all your people, we pray, in this nation and around the globe, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, as, we, as a church, we've been going through uh, Acts of the Apostles. And Acts of the Apostles, it, it happens after Jesus has died, after he's uh, been raised from the dead and he's uh, appeared to his disciples. And the church has grown. Uh, and we get to uh, chapter 5, and we're going to read... A few verses to tell you uh, where we're up to in the story. The apostles performed many miraculous signs. This is verse 12 of chapter 5, for those who are interested. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick to the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as they, he passed by. Crowds gathered 
also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. Uh, Our focus is just going to be on two verses there, verse 13 uh, and verse 14. Uh, As a child, uh, I played a game, Truth or Dare, and I'm sure some of you would have played Truth or Dare. It's a simple premise. You have two options. You can choose truth, and then that person can ask you any question which you most must answer truthfully, and I'm sure you would. Uh, And the other option is dare. And so then they say dare, and then the people in the crowd think up something that they'll dare you to do. Like, uh, when I used to play, it'd be like, get a full spoon of Marmite and eat it all, that kind of fear. Or make some sort of weird, normally involved eating and drinking, I don't know why, or make some weird, like, you know, chili and spice drink that you mix up uh, for them to drink. Uh, Easy just to choose truth, isn't it? And just, you know, get out of it somehow. But anyway, that's truth or dare. But no one, when I played truth or dare, said, I dare you, Sunday morning, go down church. Join that service and be with those people. <laughs> it wouldn't sound like much like a dare, would it? Because you know, for a, a, a dare to work, there has to be a risk associated, doesn't there? And you can see a risk associated, well, some people love Marmite, don't they? And some people hate Marmite. But there's risk associated with drinking weird chili cocktails. And there's other dares that people might give you which have risks associated. What's the risk associated with gathering with a bunch of Christians? And this morning, is, is, is that why you're here? Someone dared you to come. Did you, you sit and he said, true for dare. You said, oh, I'll take a dare. You go Sunday morning, go down that church, sit with them. Well, what would the risk be? What is the fallout from coming and gathering with people who would want to associate themselves with Jesus of Nazareth? That's what the people were doing at Solomon's Colonnade. They were associating themselves with the people associated with Jesus of Nazareth. And it was a public association. It was in Solomon's Colonnade, which is like a, a big, long porch, a public meeting space that people could see, but also people could meet in. So you'd, if you went there, you'd have been seen to be there, a public gathering around the person called Jesus of Nazareth. What's the problem with that? Well, I'll give you three reasons why I think they might have not dared join that gathering. It says that they didn't dare join. The first is this, shame. Shame. You know, we've all felt shame at some point in our lives, haven't we? Some of us feel shame for some things uh, and not others. When I was at school, uh, you had to have Adidas clothes that had three stripes, you know? And sometimes I had uh, like fake Adidas clothes and my fake Adidas, you know, my trainers weren't right and my sh- I only had two stripes rather than three stripes. So I felt shame. And, and, and children are the worst, aren't they? They're the meanest of us. I don't, know, I don't know, some people do get meaner as they get older, but hopefully some people grow out of it. Uh, and, and children can make others feel shame, can't they, by what they say, by the way they treat people. So maybe, potentially, that people gathered with, around a person called Jesus, there was a, a sense if you go there, there's going to be some shame for you. Because people call Jesus the friend of sinners. Now we take that as a good label, don't we? friend of sinners, someone who went, would go to help sinners, encourage sinners, and, and be with them. That's, that's a good thing to be a friend of sinners. But the label wasn't given like that. His label was given as a, as a label of like, who is this guy? He must be like one of them. Think of the worst people, and he's like one of them. A blasphemer, they would call him. So they dared not join these people for the, for the shame they might feel in gathering with them. Uh, the second one would have been... Um, They didn't dare because of their safety. Or, which we've become to learn in these times, our perceived safety. They they wouldn't have felt safe to gather with Jesus' people. Just think about it now. What happened to Jesus just a few weeks ago? What happened to him? He was crucified in the most horrific way. The most horrific way to kill a person was performed on Jesus, and now you want to go and associate with this Jesus. When they crucified Jesus, they said, if you live like this man, this is how we will treat you. If you are are the scum of the earth, and and because you're the scum of the earth, we we show you to be the scum of the earth, and we we nail your hands to a piece of wood until you die, and so everyone can see, look how awful you are. Not just that, that Jesus has been crucified in that way, but his followers are starting to tell people that, yes, he died, but now he's alive. 
And they took those followers and they threw them in prison. They threw them in prison and then they threatened them some more. Jesus got in trouble because he told the truth and he kept telling the truth. It's, it's hard to just keep always telling the truth, isn't it? You know, people ask you questions and you think, I, 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 how can I sort of swerve this one? Uh, does my bum look big in this? Not just that simple one, but, you know, there's, there's other questions. I think, like, I don't want to say what I think, and I, I don't want to say what I think the truth is. I don't want to say what I think is best for you. I don't know how you'll take that, and I don't know how you think of me if I say that. But here is this man, Jesus, who he, he was the way, the truth, and life. He always spoke the truth. And that was why, one of the reasons he was crucified. Do you think to gather with these people, shame. I think people won't be associated with them, shame. Second, I feel like, this could get me in trouble, <laughs> gathering with these people. I daren't join them. And then the third reason, I think, that why they didn't dare join, it was this. Um, I might get converted. <laughs> I, I, by that, I mean, I might become a Christian. I might turn into a Jesus freak. I, I might turn out to be a Bible basher. Why would I do that? Why, why would I do that? I think I want to go my way. <laughs> Thank you very much. And if I go where they are and listen to what they're saying, well, I might become like them. If you say, I'm not going to gather with them because I might get converted, what's that admitting? It's admitting there is a God who could convert you. You know, I've, I've watched lots of things and I've been around lots of things and it hasn't turned me into them. Hmm? I, 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 I was just thinking, what's the weirdest, strangest thing, place I've been that hasn't turned me into one? I've been to Yeovil City, and I haven't turned into a Yeovil City fan. Um, <laughs> I've been to Scotland, uh, and I've been to Northern Ireland. Been to, I was thinking, when you do something or you go somewhere, I, I, I've, um, oh yeah, I've, I've, I've been to a monastery and I've had a, a, a retreat with monks. It hasn't turned me into one. Uh, you know, and, and, I, and I've, I've played, what games have I played? You, know, you play weird games, don't you? And it hasn't turned a, a created a love for that game, and I've become like a tiddlywink enthusiast or whatever it is. I don't spend my hours uh, playing online poker or Scrabble. We can, uh, you know, we can put ourselves in front of things, yeah, but it doesn't mean that thing's going to take my heart and captivate me. But God has the power to do that, and we do know, even though I this games and sports and hobbies, they also do have a power like that, don't they? They can captivate our hearts and we can fall in love with them and give our lives to them. So, but some of them we don't worry about if I got addicted to Scrabble. Uh, but what if, if, if I became a Jesus freak? What if I became like a Bible? What if I became one of those? Well, let's think for a moment. We might say that the people who do that are brainwashing, though. They're seeking to brainwash people into a religion. They're going to change their hearts and minds so that they'll do this, give their money, like people's suggestion, people often argue. Then join them, they'll just take your money, rob all your time, and you'll become boring. Imagine the skills needed to take a movement where the person who's been crucified... And the person who's been crucified said, if you want to follow me, take up your cross. Deny yourself. Um, you might even have to hate your mum or dad in comparison to the love you have for me because of what people might do to you for following me. Jesus said those things. And he said, don't take it lightly following me. Like a man who goes to war, don't just follow me like it's an easy thing. No, consult like your reserves and your army. See, can you win this war following me? How amazing it would be to have a man who says those kind of things to then have a movement which passes through all the centuries right to today's period where there's people across this nation and all the na loads of nations that want to follow him. This conversion, though, that we're fearful of, and we dare not, what it does is it switches us from being selfish to being compassionate. That's why the people there, even though they didn't join them, were highly, highly regarded. They, 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 their hearts were being switched from being selfish to being compassionate. Interestingly, the people that were meeting there, earlier on we've learned about them, they sold their possessions when there was need and gave. And here we find people who are tormented and are sick come before them with their troubles and say, help us. 
So what we find of the church, the early church, is they get rid of their possessions and they take on other people's troubles. They call it the wrong way around, haven't they? You want to get rid of other people's problems, don't bring them near me. And you want to keep and grow your possessions, don't you? But here were these people who are letting go of their possessions to meet others' needs and taking on other people's troubles. They were moving from selfish hearts to compassionate hearts. And we see that the apostles, they, they healed many of them. And, and they have a particular role to, to validate their ministry. But history shows that the church continues to be compassionate. In, in the Roman Empire, it was fine to leave your children out to the elements. If you couldn't think, I can't cope with this child, I can't look after this child, it was fine to leave out the elements. And Christians were known for those who would go and take these children and bring them into their homes. This is the kind of compassion that Jesus inspires. The cross of Jesus has turned the world upside down. It's just not that people gather in meetings like this to hear what he said, but it's that the whole way of thinking has been changed from an idea of power rules to the one who serves the weakest is the greatest. That's a total upending of all the ethics that went before it. That everyone, even the lowest, has value. And that's why Christians are, are upset if we might talk about ending people's lives early at different points of time. Because the weakest are the most significant and we should serve them as Christ, who was the, God himself, took on flesh and became a servant and take himself to the lowest death, then became the greatest. We say that we, we value the low, we value the weak, we value the poor and we serve them. So they didn't dare join them because they maybe have felt shame. They might have perceived that their safety was at risk and they didn't want to get converted. Then verse 14 says, after this, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord. Nevertheless, this is, this is despite all the things I've just said, people believed. What did they believe? Well, what does a Christian believe? You can do courses on what Christians believe, and it would take you forever. You could, if you've tried, I'm sure some of you have tried, read the whole book. You know, uh, Christians, are, uh, people believe the word of God. There's 66 books in here by, by 40 different authors over 1,600 years, and why don't you read them all? <laughs> and then you'll find out what Christians believe. But that'll take your time. I know some of you start and get stuck, and that's fine. Uh, but what, what do Christians believe then? Well, here are these people. What is the thing above all other things that they believed is Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, the foundation of their belief. And three things that the apostles kept preaching would be the things they held on to most dearest is that he's alive. Jesus is alive. Yes, he was crucified, but he was resurrected and he's alive today. Some people say, I don't need Jesus. You know? Happy with the way my life is right now. Doing all right. I say there will be a day when you will need Jesus. Because there's only one who's conquered death. There's only one who's overcame the grave. There's only one who is alive and able to forgive sins and able to make you right before God. There's only one who's able to give you spiritual life when your physical life comes to an end. And his name is Jesus. only one name under heaven which man can be saved. The name of Jesus Christ. And that's why... We see when moments of people's death come, when awful events happen, people cry out on the name of the Lord. But the problem is, we don't all get that opportunity, do we? You know, some people say, well, I'll, I'll wait for my deathbed conversion. Well, you've got to have a deathbed to have a deathbed conversion. So you've got, you can't plan life like that, can you? You can't work out life to give you a window of opportunity to be in your right mind to call out to the Lord. No, some of us will be taken in our sleep. Some of us will be taken out by traffic. Some of us won't know when we're taken out because our minds go before our bodies go. So while you have your mind and your body, call upon the name of the Lord so that you may be saved. What do they believe? They believe Jesus is alive and they believed he was Lord. Now, Lord means like boss, in charge, overall, supreme. King of kings and Lord of lords. 
the supreme ruler and reigning one. So even though people threatened their lives, Jesus who gave all people life is who they needed to be making right their lives with. So they believed he was alive, they believed he was Lord, which changed their lives, and they believed he was going to return. And when he returns, we will all have to give an account of our lives. And the reality of our lives is that Jesus has given them to us as a gift. God gives them to us as grace. We didn't earn your way into this world, did you? you didn't pass a test to get here? You know, before you were born, in your unborn stage, and somehow, hey, you've made it. You're one of the ones, one of the sperms, one of the egg. You made it. You're in. Uh, you get to, because you passed this achievement, you're here, you're like, no, life is a gift. And, and as the gift is given, you will have to give an account for the things you've received before God. So they believe these things about Jesus. And because they believe those things about Jesus, they believe things about themselves. They were forgiven by him. They were made set free from him. Not sort of free from him, but free from the world because of him. And they were fortunate because they knew him. But it was Jesus who has this magnetic pull. As I said earlier, he asks us to do things which are dangerous. He calls us to lay, deny ourselves. We'd only do that because we have a magnetic pull. I don't know if you've been watching the recent BBC One thriller series. It's, um, I think it's only three parts. Laura and I haven't watched it all yet, so if you have, don't tell us the end. Um, but there's um, a guy who works in a call centre, and he gets a, a, a phone call, and someone on the phone, on the phone, phone it's, um, says, oh, they, 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 they basically talk about how they've just killed someone. Uh, and they're still, oh, oh, well, and then they go, oh, is that you, Gabe? saying he knows the, you know, the call handler uh, on the emergency service. And then he, she is someone from his childhood who he loved. And then basically he gets her to try and dispose of this body and to do all these crazy things because she has some sort of magnetic pull over her life. Because he loves her. Now Jesus won't call you to dispose of dead bodies. Um, but he does give you a magnetic pull over your life. Because his, the love for him is greater than all the things of the world. Because he created all the things in this world. And he's the source of all that is good and lovely and right. And that's what he's done to these people. He's placed a magnetic pull in their hearts that they believe him despite not wanting to think, oh no, if I thought in my right mind, would I want to follow Jesus? Yet he calls them to himself. And then finally, they believed and they were added. They were added to what? They were added to the Lord himself. And when you are added to the Lord, you're added to the church. As I've said a couple of times and is said, if you're going to love Jesus, his bride comes too, which is the church. You can't have Jesus is lovely, his bride stinks. No, when you, when you love Jesus, you will love his people. And they were added to the church. This was a miracle because they dared not, yet many did. And in the long term, as we think about what shame might come, there's going to be much more shame if we stand before the judgment seat of God and the salvation for our souls, which he has offered us freely as a gift, we rejected for some temporary applause today. And as we perceive what risk to our safety there might be in following the Lord, oh, what risk there is to not following the Lord. As he says, the greatest crime is to reject me and there will be an eternal punishment in hell for that. And oh, that we might think, I want to do things my way than go Jesus' way. Actually, God loves us and wants the best for us. So when he calls us to difficult things, it's actually for our best. Many dared not join them, yet many believed and were added. I pray that might be true of your lives this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we've been before you and we've read about this early church, how many dared not join your church, but yet many believed. We thank you by, for the, by the grace of God that happened, by, by his goodness. We thank you that God, you are good. And we pray as we think about the call of Jesus upon each of our lives, how he says, come follow me. And he says to each of us here this morning, come, follow me. To the, to the disciples, he said, lay down your fishing nets and come, follow me. To us, he might say, lay down many a thing and come, follow me. We thank you 
that as if you put that desire in our hearts to, to follow you, to, to seek you, you can be found. And you are, Lord Jesus, the pearl of great price. You are the best and the greatest and the most glorious thing. The thing that, as Susan said, is you're willing to say yes to Jesus because it is always for our best. It's for our good and for others' good that we say yes to Jesus. So give us the, the hearts to say yes to you and no to selfish ambition, no to pride and no to uh, living our best life today, but seeking to live for you for all our days. Would you make us like that, we pray. Amen.